This is not a werewolf story by Sandra Evans, Chapter 12, where Raoul learns Vincent's problem. I wait until midnight, then I put my flashlight in my pocket and stand at the door for a minute, listening. All is quiet. Come with me, I whisper to Vincent five minutes later. He pokes his head out from under his covers. He screams. I hold the flashlight up so the, that he can see it's me. What are you doing in here? He asks. How did you get in? I opened your door. It wasn't locked, I say. I need your help for an undertaking of great importance. He hops out of bed and pulls on his jeans. Do I need a jacket? Is all he asks. That's a friend for you. The kind of kid that grabs a jacket and goes with you, even when you are waking him up in the middle of the night to sneak out a window and climb down a tree taller than a three-story building and walk out into the pitch black to hunt a wild cougar. I lead him out of his room to the end of the hall. The madrona that goes past my bedroom window reaches all the way up here. The window groans as I lift it. I go out first and then point the flashlight up so Vincent can see where to step. He drops from the lowest branch and lands even more quietly than I do. The flashlight makes a circle of light at our feet. Outside of that circle, we can't see a thing. We walk very slowly, since we are walking toward a cliff. Very slowly. We step off the mowed lawn at the, of the school grounds and into the zigzag path. We walk one behind the other, Vincent in front and me in back. Maybe we should get Bobo, Vincent says, just to scare off the cougar if it's out there. No, I say, that's our mission. We want to find the cougar. Vincent stops so suddenly that I run into him, and we end up taking a shortcut down the hill to the beach. In the beginning, we do something very like somersaults. But by the end, we have crashed into enough stuff on our way down that we have straightened out a little and are rolling on our sides like kids do down grassy hills for fun. Only this hill is not grassy, and we are not having fun. Of course, I drop the flashlight when we meet the raccoon. When we finally fall onto the wet sand at the bottom of the hill, we lay there for a while, breathing. The air smells good, like fish and salt and the tar they paint on wood that sits near water. Sand fleas are jumping all over us. I pull some leaves and small branches out of my hair. I'm bleeding, just a little bit, in about 20 places. After a minute, I start to wonder, why is the sand so wet this far up the beach? I get a bad feeling. Then I hear it. Keep in mind, it's pitch black. But I know a killer wave coming when I hear it. Get up, I yell to Vincent. We barely have time to jump up onto the driftwood pile behind us before it hits. We hang on to a big log as the wave washes over us, bashing us against the wood and leaving us sputtering and coughing. Move, I shout, as I hear another wave gathering itself up. Vincent and I scuttle over the rest of the driftwood logs. We find the zigzag path and sit down. Our teeth are chattering. Sand crunches between my molars. My nose and throat have that scratchy feeling that you get after you throw up. At least it washed all the twigs out of my hair, Vincent says. And the salt in the salt water is antiseptic, I say, trying to look on the bright side too. That's why all of our cuts and welts and scrapes and abrasions hurt so especially bad. Yes, said Vincent. It's good to think that we won't have to worry about any minor infections. We find the flashlight at the top of the path right near where we bumped into each other. I pick it up, and we set out across the lawn to the school. Try again tomorrow night, I ask. Vincent takes a long time to answer. Listen, I say, I'll get us headlamps, and I'll check the tide tables in Dean Swift's office to make sure no waves sneak up on us. Yeah, yeah, says Vincent. He sounds a little grumpy. I'm in. I sigh. I'm sticky, soaked, bruised, and battered, but I'm glad to have a friend like Vincent. We start up the tree. When he gets to the window and I'm in the fork of the two biggest branches, we hear it. The cougar's screech fills the night. I can see the sound like a funnel cloud, almost, narrow where it begins, then opening out into the sky. The sound is coming from the edge of the fort closest to the beach. The cougar screams again. 
and a shudder jerks my head hard to the side. That animal is close. It's on the beach, near the driftwood pile, where we were standing ten minutes ago. We climb through the window. Vincent is shaking now, and I don't think it's just the wind in his wet clothes. I think he can see the cougar in his mind the way I can see it in mine. The huge cat pacing, sniffing the wet wood, leaping onto the pile and pausing, one paw up, its nose in the air, tracking a scent, our scent. Tomorrow night, same time, I say when we get to his room. But why are we doing this? Vincent asks. We need to get that cougar, I whisper. I think it's trying to hurt someone I love. Vincent turns his back to me. He opens his door without saying a word. I can't blame him for bailing out. The mission tonight was a ridiculous disaster, a miserable failure, a complete catastrophe. And that's only if you look at it in a really, really positive light. He steps into his room and then turns around to face me. Then we'll take care of it. You and me together, we'll get it. His eyes are scared, but he bobs his head up and down like he really means it. You know why, he says. He pulls me into his room. It's a secret. Nobody at the school but Dean Swift knows, and he only knows part of it. I sit down at the desk chair next to his bed. He sits facing me. This summer, there was a fire in my house. Me and my baby brother were sleeping upstairs. I tried to run out the door, but there was too much smoke. I ran to the window. My mom was down there, and she was crying. She said to get the baby and climb out the window. I couldn't move. I started shaking and shaking, and I fell down. I was so scared. Then a fireman broke through the door. Another one came through the window. They picked us both up and got us out of there. He stops talking, and I let him. I'm soaked and frozen to the bone, but I know better than to rush a kid through his secret. The fireman gave me a sticker and said I was really brave, but that was a lie. I didn't think about my brother once. I didn't try to save him or anything. His mouth pulls out into a straight line, and I can tell he's trying really hard not to cry. I think it's why my mom sent me here, he says. She wants me to get tough. After a minute, he looks up at me sideways so I can only see half his face. You know how that fire started? I shake my head. It was me. I found some matches in my stepdad's jacket. I wanted to see what it felt like to light one. Right before bed, while they were giving my brother a bath, I hid in the coat closet and let them all up. I thought I stomped them out, but I messed one. He covers his mouth with his hand. You're the only person who knows. My mom would leave me here forever if she knew. I won't ever tell, I say. Then all of a sudden, he grins. My mom blamed my stepdad for the fire. She almost kicked him out for it. Wouldn't that have been great? She made him give up smoking. He'd kill me if he knew it was me. Whenever they argue, she brings it up and says how his smoking almost fried us all. I try to smile, but I don't think that's funny. I know Vincent hates his stepdad, but that's a whale of a lie. This time, I'm not going to let anyone down, Vincent keeps talking. You're going to put a rock in that sling of yours, and you're going to hit that car between the eyes. You're going to knock him out, and we're going to hog tie him. When we get back to school, I'll tell everyone the whole story, and you'll be a big hero. I imagine the look on Marianne's face when she hears about it. Yeah. Then that Marianne will notice you for sure, he says with a grin. My cheeks get hot. What? You think I didn't know you're crushing on her? He rolls his eyes. She likes you already but this will show her what you're made of. As I walk back to my room, I leave squishy footprints in the carpet and on the stairs. I'm cold, I'm wet, but I'm warm inside as I think about Vincent. A hero and a storyteller, they go together. You can't have one without the other.